a little math review. So in, I guess I can actually just show it, in on the Moodle page under week one is a link to a PDF that I threw together on some of the content that appears in this course and some of the math that might be a little rusty. Maybe um, maybe it's been a while since you've done some of these things. Um, some, of, some, of these, uh, some of these ideas I go into more detail than others. Usually the ones where I've noticed that it gives students a little bit more trouble. Some of them I just kind of remind you, you know, just remember geometry is a thing and we should remind ourselves kind of areas of circles, circumferences, areas of triangles, and yada yada. And then we will work some calculus into this course, but since I know a lot of you are taking calculus alongside this course, the calculus will be gradually eased in and I will try to uh, follow, you know, we will, we will, actually we will start doing calculus next week, but it will be fairly conceptual. Um, at least at first, because um, I know you are still learning about this stuff in your math courses. All right, um, so you can check that out if you want um, a little bit more detail about the math in this course. But some things, for example, that I know I know will come up a lot. You know, if you are not super familiar or have forgotten. Um, triangles. Uh, we're going to do, we're, there's going to be a lot of triangles in this class, pr particularly the right triangle. So where one of the angles is 90 degrees, 90 degrees, or uh, pi over 2 radians. Again, if it's been a while and you don't quite remember what a radian is, that's another thing you can review. Because um, we will also be doing some trigonometry in this course. You know, so if you have, for example, a side A, a side B, a side C, and we know it's a right, a right triangle, we know that there is a relationship between A, B, and C, as well as the, um, the two non-right right, uh, two angles that are not 90 degrees, for example. So for example, the Pythagorean theorem, will pop up a lot. You know, the relationship between the, the sides that are adjacent to the 90 degree and the hypotenuse, which is opposite the 90 degree angle, as well as things like sine of theta. If you think back to uh, Sokotoa, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is always the one that's kind of directly, you know, across from the angle or I like to think of it as since I drew this little swoosh you know to represent theta in this case you know that swoosh touches the hypotenuse and it touches the, the side of the triangle that is adjacent and then the one that's not touching that little swoosh is the opposite so then this would be uh, B over C opposite over hypotenuse in that case and then similarly, cosine of theta will be A over C, adjacent over hypotenuse. So algebraically, it might be the case where if I know the hypotenuse, uh, I know some value for C, um, I know the angle theta, I might want to calculate what the length A is, for example. Um, so those are some good things to remind yourself of. Um, from geometry. Triangles in particular will, will um, be very present in this class. All right, let's see, what else? Um, basic algebra, I assume people have some decent comfort with algebra. So there'll be a decent amount of solving for x, um, but it might not necessarily look like the way that it looked um, It looked in an algebra class. You know, this is an example of one formula we will see um, in early kinematics. This also shows you that in physics, we're gonna be working with a lot of symbols. Um, I typically try to avoid plugging in numbers until the absolute very end. Um, it reduces the, uh, the, um, 
the chance that I will make a mistake and you know, on my calculator, for example. So typically we will always be working with symbols um, and then plugging in numbers at the very end. And we'll go over some problem solving strategies once we actually get into doing problems. But for example, you know, you might see this equation and I might ask, you know, what is the value of t that satisfies this equation if we say have numbers for y, y naught, and v naught, and g. So in that case, the only variable I don't know, for example, might be t, and I might ask, you know, what is t in this case? Uh, where strategies might include maybe you can factor and solve for t, or maybe you can use the quadratic formula in this case. There might be two ways to go about solving this. All right, so I will I'll let you kind of glance through the handout um, for the math review to kind of give you a sense of some of the other content that is necessary. There are two things, though, that I want to actually review in detail. And the first one is scientific notation. So scientific notation, uh, this is also a good review of exponents, is we might encounter numbers in this course that look like, say, 0 0.0002, or you might, you might encounter a number that is 2, 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, 3, 6, you know, 4, or something like that. And while these numbers are all fine and good, there's nothing wrong with these numbers, um, often in science we want to write this in a, in a more easier to understand uh, form, which we use scientific notation. So the idea behind scientific notation is that we, we rewrite the number such that it is of the form a times 10 to the b, uh, where a is a number between negative 10 and 10, and b is what I call the order of magnitude. In scientific notation, it will turn out that this will be a integer. Um, so 1, 2, negative 3, uh, negative 5, some whole number uh, that could be either positive or negative. So again, it's, it's kind of bringing to the forefront kind of the overall value, A, um, and then kind of gives you a sense of the order of magnitude that's associated with that number, which is 10 to the B. Uh, so very small numbers like, like this. Um, Essentially, you want to see how can I write it as a times 10 to the b. Remember that multiplying by 10 or dividing by 10 is essentially all you're doing is you're shifting the decimal spot to the left or to the right. If I take a number, um, I can even do it below here. Um, you know, if I do uh, 2.1 times 10, that's just the same thing as 21. 21 times 10 is 210. So when I multiply by a positive number of 10, I could think of this as 10 to the one, it's the same thing as 10. What that is doing is it's moving the decimal to the right. Yeah, so multiplying by positive numbers of 10 is just moving the decimal to the right. Versus 2.1 divided by 10 Divided by 10, you might imagine, um, is going to have the effect of moving the decimal to the left. Just as review, another way I can write this is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 1. In a fraction, I can always bring the denominator into the numerator. I just have to change the sign of the exponent. And this is the same as 0 0.21. Then 0 0.21 divided by 10 the same thing as 0 0.21 times 10 to the minus 1, which has, is just 0 0.021. So in this case,
it amounts to just moving the decimal spot to the left in that case. So I'm multiplying and dividing by 10, you're just shifting the decimal spot around. And that is useful here, if I go back up to the top. Um, I could ask, our, ask ourselves um, 0 0.0002. How can I write this in a form such that it's a times b, or 10 to the b, such that if I were to follow out these rules of moving the decimal to the left or to the right, I would get back this original number. So I might think of it as 2 times 10 to the, and then I could count how many decimal spots I have to move it over. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So then I might write this as 10 to the minus 4. And again, I can always check my work. 2 times 10 to the minus 4, the minus sign means I'm moving the decimal spot to the left. If I actually were to take you know, 2.0 times 10 to the minus 4, and I move the decimal spot over from where it starts, four spots over, one, two, three, four, to the left. This would get me back a number that looks like this, which is exactly what I started with. Similarly, what was the other number? It's now been lost to my screen. Two, one, two, zero, zero, one, two, six, four. I want to write this as some smaller number that is between negative 10 and 10. Uh, so in that case, I'm going to write as 2.12001364. But then I want to multiply it by 10 to the something. That something should get me back to the original answer. So again, I could ask myself, how many spots do I have to move the decimal spot over to get back to the right answer? And I can think of that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I would write this as 2.12001364 times 10 to the eighth would be scientific notation. And then do, does a negative number change anything? It does not. Because um, again, the first number can be between negative 10 and 10. So I just move the decimal spot to the left and to the right, the, the amount I need, and then see what do I have to do to get back to the original answer. It looks like in this case, I would have to move the decimal spot over to the right one. Uh, so I would write this as plus one in that case. So that would be scientific notation. Now, if we were meeting in person, what we would do here is we would have some sort of, um, you would have essentially a, a little group that you would break out to and work on this, or we would work on this individually, and then we would you know, vote using clickers or using like little colored pieces of paper on which of these answers you think is correct. Um, the nice thing about recordings is you can now just pause it, pause the video, figure it out for yourself, and then I will work through the answer I um, mean, you should check your work with the answer I arrive at. And it's very simple for you to just not pause it, not do anything, and just kind of passively listen. But I really do encourage you for these sorts of problems to actually pause the video, try it out for yourself, and then see how your answer compares to mine. So in this case, um, the question is, Write 00592 in scientific notation. So in this case, I want to move the decimal around so that it is some number between negative 10 and 10. So in that case, uh, I would write this as 5.92. And then I write, have to write that as 10 to the something. And what do I have to do in order to get it back to the original answer? So it looks like in this case, I need to move it over. Um, let's see if the decimal spot were here. I'd have to go one, two, three to the left. So I'd write this as negative three, negative, because I'm going to the left. And I had to move the decimal spot over three spots. So in that case, I think that makes the answer 
um, B. Now, if you did not get B, watch this again and or try it on your own again and see where you went wrong and how how you what you did was different than the way I approach this problem. For example, you know, that would be a good strategy to try for these sorts of things. All right, how are we on time? 40 minutes. Good. All right. Um, and then there will also be, so there are scientific notation exponents, both in the review packet. There's also going to be some graphing that we're going to have to do, but I'll save that to when we actually have to do the graphing, which actually will be next lecture. Now I have in my notes to remind, uh, use external resources, which is a, something I should have said earlier as well. Um, you don't have to just rely on my lectures. I will not be offended if you consult outside sources to help you learn this material. I actively encourage you to. So some of you might be familiar with Khan Academy, K-A-H-N, I believe is how it's uh, spelled, K-A-H-N. Um, you know, they have a lot of videos on physics, you know, kind of introductory physics problems where they will solve particular problems. Um, and if that helps you, awesome. You should consult those outside resources. Now, that doesn't mean when you're doing the homework that you should immediately just try to look up the answer. That is not going to help you learn the material. Um, and you're not going to be able to do that on exams. Uh, but if you're reviewing your lecture notes, if you're trying to think about how you might solve these sorts of problems uh, on a homework set, you know, it could be the possible that there are external resources that can solve similar kinds of problems that you can then study. You know, study not only the answer that they get, but how they actually approached the problem. What did they do to get to the solution? Um, and then file that away in your kind of mental, mental bank of here are strategies to think about when I solve physics problems. All right, so the last thing I wanted to do today is talk about um, units. So this is a physical science. Um, we are definitely going to be working with a lot of numbers over the course of this semester. Um, but what makes this different than, say, a math class is that the quantities that we are talking about are, are relevant to some sort of physical entity that exists in the universe, um, which could be, for example, sizes or lengths. You know, I am six feet tall, for example. The idea is that I'm not just six tall. That has no meaning. If I say, how tall are you? And I say six, six what? Um, it's, it's not meaningful until I say I'm six feet tall. The unit, feet in this case, is what gives the number meaning. You know, how old are you? Okay, I'm, you know, 34. Like, okay. You might in your head be like, okay, he means 34 years. But think in your head, you are giving that number a unit, 34 years, is the unit is what gives that meaning. You know, I could say I'm 34 days old. That means something quite different than being 34 years old. Um, or I'm 34 seconds old. Um, or 34, you know, periods around the center of the Milky Way, which would actually make me like a billion years old or something like that. So there are various different kinds of units that can be used to describe different physical quantities. Um, and in this class, all numbers are meaningless without a unit. If you just give me a number without a unit, uh, then I essentially can't give you any credit, really, um, because I don't know what that number necessarily means unless there's a unit that is associated with it. So it's then helpful if we have some sort of you um, agreed upon set of units that we can use in order to describe things in this course. So this gets us to the um, what is sometimes called or what I will call the MKS system. So 
So in physics, we will use the MKS system. It is part of the system, uh, the international system of units. So this was a set of units that was agreed upon, I think in the 1970s, um, of just gave scientists a common language to describe lengths, times, velocities, accelerations, forces, energies, you know, all these sorts of quantities that we'll talk about can all be described using the same language. So that if we talk about things in, in terms of the MKS system, people from you know, all around the world can talk about numbers and we all have kind of a feel of what we're talking about. It would be complete headaches if we had you know, different unit systems uh, for every different you know, branch of science or country or whatnot. And unfortunately, America is not perfect because we have some units that we just refuse to let go of. Um, you know, Fahrenheit versus Celsius, for example. Um, or wanting to work with miles compared to kilometers. All right, so this system, what this means, the M is meter, the K stands for kilogram, and the S stands for seconds. So it kind of defines the three fundamental quantities where most other units um, that we'll talk about in this course can be derived from these three, the meter, the kilogram, and the second. So it's saying that those are kind of the base. We might call these the, you know, the the base units that we are working with. You know, for example, astronomy. Uh, we don't use the MKS system, but we use the CGS system. Uh, so instead of the meter, we use the centimeter. Instead of the kilogram, we use the gram, and we still use seconds for seconds. Why in astronomy, when we are talking about things like light years, do we think that the centimeter makes more sense, which is smaller than a meter? I don't know, but um, actually I do know, but it's hist historical is, is really just the answer. But in this class, we'll use... Uh, we will stick with the MKS system of units. And the international system of units, um, we can just talk about the um, I think it's seven or eight um, fundamental units that make up everything. Uh, so these base units, you know, so we've already talked about the meter, which is length. So if you want to talk about lengths, how long something is, how tall something is, um, how far away something is, the base unit is the meter. The kilogram defines mass. So if you're talking about how much stuff there is, really it's just an accounting of how many protons, neutrons, and electrons make up something, you're talking about the mass of an object which the base unit is the kilogram. The second is the fundamental unit of time. Uh, so how much time has elapsed, how long something takes, the duration of something measured in seconds, which again will be what we work mostly with. These three, there's the Kelvin, which is the unit of temperature. So if you've taken, if you've ever taken chemistry or bio, you've likely encountered the Kelvin unit. Um, very simple to relate it back to Celsius, and then a slightly different formula um, to get it into Fahrenheit. There is the mole, where I guess what would I call this? the amount of a substance. If I want to talk about, you know, the quantity of how much substance there is, you know, are there are three carbon atoms or are there are 20 carbon atoms. You know, instead of talking in terms of individual atoms, I can talk about it in terms of the moles of a substance. Uh, we will unlikely ever see the mole in this class. Uh, then what else is there? This one you will see in physics three. The ampere, which is a measure of current, uh, so electric current in particular. Um, so you'll see that in physics three, I'm talking about electric charges and the flow of charges. Uh, 
is the last one? Oh, yes. And then there is the candela. Which really just kind of relates to like the brightness of an object. Um, you know, unsurprisingly, it kind of looks like it, you know, the word candle is worked into uh, uh, the name of the unit. So these are the seven base units that make up the international system of units. The history behind it actually is kind of interesting. Um, you, yeah, I think I even had to try it yourself just to make sure people were paying attention. Um, yeah, the origin of, of some of these uh, is actually quite interesting. Some of them have actually changed in just the last couple of years and how they are defined. Typically, all these quantities were defined in that there was some fundamental object that we said, you know, essentially we said was the definition of, say, a kilogram. That you could go to a vault in Paris and find this little object, you know, that's kind of sealed away in various tubes and vaults, and that represented the kilogram. So if you wanted to measure anything else in the universe to how, in terms of how many kilograms it was, you could put whatever that obj other object is on, on one side of the scale, put this kilogram on the other side of the scale, and use that, to, and use that to relatively determine how many kilograms make up the object that you're considering, for example. Though it was just... Um, in the, I think in the 80s, I think the fundamental ma mass unit, uh, is that true? No, no, it was the length that was changed in the 80s. I think, I think this, the fundamental mass unit um, changed just last year in 2019, where we don't necessarily use an actual physical object anymore, uh, but we define the fundamental unit of mass in terms of physical constants. So using things like the speed of light which is the light, the speed, the velocity that light travels in. Turns out it's a fundamental constant of the universe. Light always travels at the same speed. Um, and it's kind of like a universal speed limit. Uh, combining that with other physical constants, like there's a, there's a constant called Planck's constant, which is related to quantum mechanics, so the physics of the very, very small. That By using different combinations of these fundamental constants of nature, you can back out things like the gram, or the kilogram, the second, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it looks like I have in my notes that in 2019, the me the kilogram and the uh, Kelvin were redefined in terms of fundamental constants rather than in terms of actual physical objects or quantities. I think the Kelvin, it used to be defined in terms of the, the triple point of water, which is just above zero degrees Celsius. And uh, that was kind of used to, you know, that was where you could kind of create your temperature scale. Uh, but now we can do it in terms of, probably in that case, Boltzmann's constant, which is a physical constant that's involved with uh, thermodynamics. All right, so uh, yeah, this one is kind of just making sure that you're paying attention. So again, the International System of Units uh, uses the kilogram uh, as, its, as the fundamental unit of mass. Um, not pounds uh, or slugs if you're British. Um, and this is a good example of what we'll learn in this course where there are sometimes there are words that we use in everyday speech that we are that are actually slightly being inappropriately used when we talk about them in physics. You, know, you might think that pounds, I step on a scale, it reads 160 pounds. I might take that to quantify my mass. And that technically is incorrect. We will learn that actually pounds and slugs, you know, what you read when you step on a scale, is actually measuring something called your weight, which is not the same thing as your mass. The weight is, some, is taking into account both your mass and the gravity of the object that you're, that you're near. So in that case, your weight takes into account your, the mass, how many protons, neutrons, and electrons make me up, as along with the fact that I'm near the gravity you know, the gravitational field of the Earth pulling down on me. Which is why, if you've heard, like, oh, go to the moon, you weigh less on the moon, that's what, that's what it means. You know, by going to the moon, I'm not shedding off protons and electrons. Um, in going to the moon, I still have the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons that make me up. Um, but I'm in a... Ver I, the moon has a weaker gravitational field, so as a result, my weight decreases, but my mass has stayed the same. So that's, a, that's an example of something we'll have to 
make sure we're being very careful about when we think about uh, stuff in this course. All right, so then um, let me go back to this. So based on my timer, uh, at like 55 minutes, which really would be when I would stop this lecture. This lecture is going to be a little bit longer just because there was some of uh, that initial stuff. In general, I will say that lectures typically will not last the full hour. Um, but this lecture is going to be, I just wanted to be all self-contained. Uh, so this, this lecture is going to be a little bit longer. All right, so then there's also things called the derived units. So these are units that might appear um, by combining other fundamental units. So for example, velocity. If I want to talk about the units of velocity, I'll put that, I'll use the kind of square brackets to mean units of We will learn that velocity is defined as a distance over a time, or it's defined as, say, a length over a time. So for example, velocities might have a unit of, say, meters per second, for example. Could be an example of a derived unit that combines two other units, meters per second. Meet, meters being length divided by time, a unit of time might be the second, so you have meters divided by seconds. You know, another could be, say, miles per hour. Miles is a measure as a length as a length unit, hours is a time unit, miles per hour would be a velocity, for example. So I have, um, yeah, so there's, um, if you could check out the, uh, the appendix of our textbook, there's an it shows you some examples, some of the derived units we might see in this class. You know, some of them are kind of simple that we've already, you've probably already seen, like areas and volumes. Uh, velocity is one we just talked about, you know, length over time or displacement over time. So it might have a unit of meters per second. Where area, you know, length times breadth, you know, or length times width you know, length times height, whatever you want to say. You know, it's one length multiplied by another length. Um, so in that case, the unit is length times length. So it might be meters times meters or meters squared. Volumes then are meters cubed, for example. Which gets into another point that units themselves can have powers. You can have exponential uh, um, numbers associated with the units as well. A meter, a meter, meter squared is nothing more than just meter times meter. Uh, the same laws of exponents apply to the units as well, which will be what we do um, in the last kind of 10 minutes of this, of this class. <laughs> All right, so the only other thing I want to say about kind of the base units that we're using in this course, along with the derived units, is that sometimes prefixes are attached to units. So if I go back to this, um, And we've actually already seen an example of that with the kilogram versus the gram. So um, the relationship is 10 to the 3 grams equals 1 kilogram. Or equivalently, 10 to the minus 3 kilograms equals 1 gram. I have two examples of these prefixes. So I can attach onto the gram, instead of just talking about the gram, I could talk about the kilogram or the centigram or the megagram. You know, another example is 10 to the two centimeters equals one meter. Prefixes can be kind of nice because just like how scientific notation can be nice because it, it turns an otherwise messy number that might have lots of zeros or might have you know, a long string of numbers you know, before a decimal spot into something that's a little bit easier to read. Um, sometimes even that, I, we can make it even more simpler 
uh, by kind of having the unit absorb that order of magnitude. So instead of instead of writing, you know, instead of writing, you know, I could have something like 212 centimeters. I could first say, well, maybe I want to do that in scientific notation. And I might write this as 2.12 times 10 to the 2 centimeters. But then I could identify using this that 10 to the 2 centimeters is the same thing as 1 meter. So I could take this 10 to the 2 centimeters and replace it with just this is the same thing as 2.12 meters. For example, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to read, um, depending on the sorts of problems that you are working on. So, this is a table from your textbook that just gives you some examples of the ones that we might see in this course. The ones that are labeled frequent, um, I will typically always give you these conversion factors on your exams, but these ones that are labeled frequent really are frequent, and so um, it would not be terrible if you memorize them just because they're going to pop up all the time. You know, so for example, if we wanted to think about how do we read this, here, let me, I'll write this on the side. You know, if I had something like uh, one, let me see, let's use one megasecond, what does that mean? if I wanted to use this table. Well, I could look at this table, I could say, okay, the prefix of mega, or capital M, is 10 to the six, or a million. So all that's mean is that one megasecond is the same as 10 to the six seconds. Or a megasecond is a million seconds. That's how you might read this table. So then there, you can see there are the units that are bigger than the fundamental base unit, and then there are units that are smaller than the base unit. Which actually is kind of interesting when you think about it, um, that the MKS system is meters, kilograms, seconds. You, you, so that one of the base units has a prefix attached to it versus using, say, meters, grams, and seconds. Um, I would venture to guess that's probably historical. Um, actually, I think that is the answer. I think historically, when, when since this was all done in Paris, uh, that the French had a unit that was close to a kilogram already, and just French pride, I guess. You know, they wanted then the base unit to be close to the unit they were already using for, for mass, uh, so they adopted the kilogram as the base mass unit compared to the meter in the second. All right. So now let's go over in the last five minutes or so. The rules of units. So again, we will be dealing with a lot of units and manipulating numbers with units in this course. Uh, so it's good that we practice and know how to actually work with units. And I essentially I boiled it down to if you know how, how to work with these three rules, uh, anything involving units uh, will be very straightforward and will be able for you to answer on your own. So let's just go through uh, all three. I'll do an example kind of of each, and then we'll call it a day. So rules of units. Rule number one, in equations, all terms must have the same unit. What do I mean by that? Let's go here. Um, so let's see, so let's call this rules of units. Rule one, I won't bother copying it because you can just go back in the video and look at it. Uh, in equations, all terms must have the same unit. So what do I mean by that? Let me just think of an example. Well, I think I already wrote this as an example earlier. So here's an equation that we'll see probably in week two of this class um, that relates the final, 
the final height. So maybe I maybe if I uh, throw a ball into the air, um, the height it's at at a given point in time um, relates to its initial height. initial vertical velocity the acceleration from gravity and the time elapsed don't worry about understanding any of that here we're just thinking about the units If I look at this, I might think final height, okay, that sounds like it's relating to a distance. So I might make an educated and correct guess that the unit of this term on the left hand side has units of length. You know, maybe, maybe y is three meters, maybe it's, you know, two centimeters, maybe it's six light years, whatever y is. Um, it is something that relates to a height or a length or a distance. With just that piece of information alone, I can say something about the units of every other term in this equation. So let me actually use the highlighter. If I go back up to this equation here, you know, this is one term that we just looked at. You know, so that is kind of this right here. This is another term in the equation. This quantity is a third term. And I'm out of colors. Um, and then this is a fourth term in the equation. And again, even if I don't have any clue what any of those symbols mean or represent, I know that this y naught Whatever it is, it must also have units of length. I know that whatever, I'm running out of space here. I might not know what V naught is, I might not know what T is, but I know they are together a term in this equation. So I know that whatever they are, when I multiply them together, that quantity that product rather better have units of length. And then similarly, g t squared better have units of length. Note here, I don't really care about the numbers, negatives, one halves, those don't have units associated with them. I'm just looking at the units. That these quantities all must have the same unit. That's rule one, every term. You know, and if that seems abstract, just think like if I were to tell you three meters equals two seconds. That clearly is nonsense. Um, the idea there is that, you know, when you have relationships between things like an equation, all the terms that are separated by plus and minus signs uh, must have the same unit. That is rule one. Rule two. Algebra of units is the same as the number they accompany, numbers they accompany. Let's actually take a look at that using what we were looking at here and confirm rule one by looking at rule two. All rule two, two means is when you're multiplying and dividing uh, numbers that have units, you do the same thing to the unit. If you multiply two numbers together, you multiply their units together. If you divide two numbers, you divide their units. Let's look at the example of we have this term here, v naught t. Suppose I know that v naught is a velocity and has a unit of um, its unit, say, is meters per second. And I know t is a measure of time and it has a unit of seconds. And I could ask, what is then the unit of v naught times t? You know, we could even give some numbers. Say v naught is three meters per second 
and t is 2 seconds. Then v naught times t is the same thing as 3 meters per second times 2 seconds. And you might think, okay, the answer is 6. And I would say, ah, mm, 6 what? So here you would say you are, you are correct that the number needs to be 6. You're multiplying 3 times 2. So you also multiply the units times each other as well. You know, I might even write it like this. I might write it as 3 times 2, and then it's meters per second times seconds. You know, this could be a kind of weird but correct way to write that expression out. And then I do the numbers, 3 times 2 is 6. And then I look at the units and say, OK, I have meters divided by seconds times seconds. So there's a seconds on the bottom. There's a seconds on the top. They cancel each other out then the leftover unit is meters. So then I would say the answer is 6 meters. Which, throwback to rule 1, is indeed a unit of length, like we expected it to be. OK, so the algebra of units is the same as the algebra of the numbers you are doing uh, the calculations with. If you're taking a square root of two numbers, you know we might see something that looks like um, uh, um, you know, I think like L divided by G, for example, um, where the length of L, where L, let's just say, is 3 meters and G is 10 meters per second squared, for example. And I could ask, what is the unit of the square root of L over G? Also, what's the number as well? So again, not too hard to do. I could just plug in things if I wanted to. 3 meters, 10 meters per second squared, all under the square root. And if I wanted to, I could just break the numbers apart, so I know this is going to be just 3 divided by 10 all in the square root. Then this is also going to be the square root of meters divided by meters per second squared in the square root. And I might say, okay, I don't know what the square root of uh, 3 divided by 10 is. Maybe good practices, we could go back to this guy. Can I do SQRT? Oh, man. I'm actually starting to like this thing. 3 divided by 10. Okay, it seems about 0 0.5. We'll just say 5. Now I have to think about what we do with the units. Um, and here is another thing to review. If you're a little rusty with fractions, if I look back at this, I could think of this as this is really a fraction of fractions. I could think of this as meters divided by 1. So you have a fraction divided by a fraction. If you remember the, the rule from high school, you flip the, the bottom one and then you multiply them together. So this would be the same thing as the square root of the numerator, me, meters divided by 1, I guess. And I flip the bottom one, so that'd be second squared divided by meters. And we can't forget about the square root. The square root is still, still around. Um, but here you can see the meters, there's one on top and one on the bottom, those cancel. This leaves me with 0 0.55 square root of second squared. The square root, eh, I'll just do it all. Square root is just the same thing to the 1 half power, if you uh, need to remind yourself of that. 0 0.55, then rules of exponents. Uh, if I'm taking an exponent to an exponent, it's the same thing as if I just multiply them together, so it's 1 half times 2, or it's just 0.55 seconds, or seconds to the first power. All right, these are all good, um, in case we need a little extra review about these things. But again, notice at the end of the day, the unit op operated with the same um, 
algebra as the number did. All right, last but not least. Units can be converted using a conversion factor, a ratio equal to unity but has mixed units. All right. Let's think of this. Um, a baker's dozen is 13 loaves of bread. So I could say maybe I have 13 loaves equals one baker's dozen. I'll abbreviate it so I don't have to write all that out. We would all agree that the left-hand side of this expression, 13 loaves, is the same thing as the right-hand side, one baker's dozen. So you would also hopefully agree with me when I say 13 loaves divided by one baker's dozen that this fraction is equal to unity. 13 loaves is the same as one baker's dozen, so this is something that is equal to one, in a sense. The numerator and the denominator are the same. This quantity here um, is called a conversion factor. It is something that is equal to unity. 13 loaves is the same as one baker's dozen, so when I divide them, that is equal to unity. And it's these conversion factors. Notice that it has a, there are two different units in there. There's loaves and then there's baker's dozen. This is what allows us to convert from one unit to the next, that I just multiply a number by the right conversion factor um, in order to get the answer to have the desired unit I want. So suppose then I have the question of 39 loaves equals how many baker's dozen? Now this is simple enough that you might be able to just reason out three. The answer should be three, but let's actually go through the, the steps. Even though this, one, this problem is fairly simple, let's actually very carefully go through the steps so you can see how I'm applying the conversion factor to change units. So the first thing I would do, I would write thir 39 loaves. That is the kind of how I'm starting this problem. Then I'm going to say that's the same thing as 39 loaves times 1. Nothing too profound there. Um, but now I'm going to write down the same thing, loaves. But instead of just writing it as one, I'm gonna write that one in a special way, a way that is the, a, a conversion factor that will make sure that the loaves unit disappears and it's replaced with Baker's dozen. So in this question, now I have to ask myself, is it what I wrote up above or is it something else? You know, if you think about this, if I go back up here, I could have also written one baker's dozen divided by 13 loaves equals one. This is also an example of a conversion factor, but it is a different conversion factor than the one I wrote before. Just notice that the units have switched, switched places. And I could plug either of them into this expression down below, but only one of them is going to give me the right answer, or at least an answer that looks and makes a meaningful sense. So I will just, for the sake of time, you, know, you might pause and think about which one you think is correct. Um, though I should have told you to do that before I wrote down the answer. Um, so in this case, this is the correct conversion factor to use. And again, let's see why that is the case. So rule two, the algebra of the units matches the algebra of the numbers. If I look at these numbers, I'm going to do 39 times 1 divided by 13. So then the units are going to be loaves times baker's dozen divided by loaves. Again, 
it was that the 39 had this unit associated with it, 1 had this unit associated with it, and 13 had this unit associated with it. So 39 times 1 divided by 13 is 3. And then if I look at the units, there's a loaves on the top and the bottom. They cancel out with one another. And I'm left with only the only unit that's left is baker's dozen. So the answer is then 3 baker's dozen. Had I used the other conversion factor, I would have still gotten a number, but it would have had a unit that was something like loaves squared divided by baker's dozen, which I don't know what that means. Um, it still technically is correct, um, but it's not quite what the problem asks for. The, the, the problem asks for how many baker's dozen are there. And again, this is a good example of how it's worth solving simpler problems first. When you're first approaching a subject. Now you can use simpler problems like this where you already know the answer through some other means to test out how you're doing something to make sure you really kind of understand the process that is going behind uh, the steps and the mathematical techniques that you're applying here. Because um, you might have learned something like about changing units, you know, I remember learning it in chemistry in high school where it was essentially there was a, like this horizontal line with a bunch of vertical lines and I always, you know, you essentially just, you know, like filled in the boxes with the right units and whatnot and it was a good strategy but I don't think it I think that kind of hides what you were actually doing um, where here I'm trying to give you a little bit more of a sense of kind of where that's all coming from um, and then once you feel like you understand this again use whatever method makes the most sense for you all right and then this and don't worry this will be essentially what we do not the first time we meet um, but the second time we meet and actually do good earnest group work uh, will be a lot, will be kind of some math review and working on playing around with units. All right. And again, not all lectures will be this long. Just we had the expert TA and the metacognition stuff as well, which made this lecture a little bit longer. Um, yeah. All right. Very good. I will see you soon.